sticking with the pointy end. It's kind of a guiding principle with bayonets. This video is not about combat techniques or the value of a butt of a muscular rifle as a club versus the reach advantage of using the tip. This video is discussing the bayonet as a piece of material culture and it's changed throughout time. So why fight with a heavy, slightly unwieldy spear when you have a firearm? Firearms take time to reload and require ammunition. Sharp pieces of metal do not. Modern, short, high-capacity carbines have a lot less use for bayonets. But that's the end of the story. Let's start at the beginning. As a caveat, I'm going to be quite Anglo-centric in my approach here. It's my personal point of reference, and given British military conservatism, it's likely that when the British adopt something, the Continental Powers will have adopted it already. The idea of combining a bladed weapon with a firearm goes back to the very dawn of firearms. The fundamental problem was created by the reload time of muzzle loader. That's the heart of the issue. A 14th century Chinese treatise refers to such a combination weapon as a fire lance. For those who think the reload time of a muzzle loader is measured in minutes, 20 to 30 seconds is a more realistic number. Using paper cartridges, like this, which was normally the case from the mid-17th century onwards. In Europe, early musketeers would be formed into units alongside pikemen and men-at-arms. The best example of this is the 16th century Spanish tercio. The firearms were fired at enemy formations, while the pikes protected from cavalry, and the men-at-arms engaged the pike blocks. Muskets at the time were heavy, clumsy weapons. Um, they usually were fired using a matchlock ignition, and used forked rest to stabilise them. There was a lighter version used without a rest, and that was referred to in English sources as a caliber or an arquebus. Gervais Markham in 1625 wrote, The strong, tall, and best persons to be pikes. The squarest and broadest will be fit to carry muskets, and the least and nimblest may be turned to the arquebus. The term bayonet, appears first in 1655, referring to a long knife made in Bayonne in France. These early bayonets were plug bayonets, daggers with a tapered round hilt that could be jammed down into the muzzle of a firearm, turning it into an improvised spear, turning a musketeer into a spearman. By 1670, they had spread to England. Sir James Turner wrote, Knives whose blades are one foot long made for both cutting and thrusting, the haft being made to fill the bore of a musket, will do more execution than the sword or the butt of a musket. In June 1672, they had been manufactured in England and used to equip the newly raised Prince Rupert's Regiment of Dragoons. The 1670s saw a great increase in the use of snap hands locks, which are an early type of flint lock. This greatly improved the reliability of muskets. The expedition to Virginia in 1676 were armed with 300 matchlocks and 200 snap ounces. This uptake of firearms, with the added flexibility of bayonets being introduced, caused the pike to become obsolete in most European armies. The plug bayonet suffers from one big problem. You cannot fire the weapon with one installed so a unit with its bayonets fixed lost any ranged capability they had. That being said, the cutler Thomas Elliot in 1676 received an order for knives, such as Prince Rupert shoots out of his guns, which makes you think. The solution to this problem was the socket bayonet. A blade with a ring that sits over the muzzle and is offset from the muzzle enough to allow the musket to be fired and reloaded safely. The English introduced these in the late 1690s. Various models with different locking systems to hold them onto the muskets were experimented with, along with the adoption of the triangular blade, which is much stiffer than a flat blade. This socket bayonet I have here is for the Panton 1853 Enfield rifled musket. It's made of thick, solid steel, designed to withstand rough punishment with a stiff, hollow ground, 
triangular blade. It's designed to slide over the muzzle and lock onto the front sight of the Enfield with a locking ring, like so. Uh, this doesn't fit quite right because this isn't a real Enfield, it's a replica. The blade is offset on the right side of the barrel, and it was made assuming the user was right-handed. It cannot be offset below the barrel because of the need to access the ramrod. It cannot be offset above the barrel because of the gun sight. By offsetting it to the right, it's as out of the way as possible for a right-handed soldier to reload. Uh, the loading drill looks something like this. Bit awkward to do in front of the camera, sorry. Hopefully you can see the bayonet blade is not pointing straight ahead. Its point leans outwards. This is to prevent the soldier from impaling their hands on the tip when reloading. As I hope you can see here, there's no way my hand can get caught on that tip. Alongside the socket bayonet, another type of bayonet developed, the sword bayonet. Having its origins with the sword plug bayonets, these long bladed bayonets were designed to attach to the shorter carbine rifles used by some soldiers. The Baker rifle, which was adapted from the German Jaeger rifle, was issued to British rifle regiments during the Napoleonic Wars had a 24-inch long sword bayonet with a solid brass hilt and knuckle bow, and marked the beginning of widespread use of sword bayonets by British infantry. This sword bayonet is a replica of the pattern 1856 sword bayonet for the P-56 and P-61 Enfield short rifle, which was in use by British Army NCOs and the rifle regiments. This replica is of a P-58 naval rifle, which was meant to fit a cutlass bayonet, pictured here. The P-56 sword bayonet has a yatagan blade, with its distinctive recurved shape. For a discussion of the combat properties of this iconic Turkish blade, I recommend watching the video on the subject by Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria. I put a link in the description. When fixed, the yatagan blade serves the same purpose as the point of a socket bayonet. That being... The point is offline, keeping the blade safely away from the hand when reloading. The key point of sword bayonets is their length. They always attach to shorter carbines, so the combined length of bayonet and weapon is the same length as a full-sized rifle with the shorter bayonet meaning the soldier doesn't have to sacrifice any reach advantage. In addition, in close fighting, the bayonet serves as a handy short sword, and the carbine itself can be used like a shield. In New Zealand, these were popular with soldiers because they were used as machetes, cutting their way through dense bush. Another famous historical rifle to use a Yatagan sword bayonet is the French Chassepot needle rifle. Bayonet pictured here. The change to breech-loading firearms like the needle rifle removed the construction requirement for the point of the bayonet to tilt outwards to protect the hand. The shorter Snyder rifles initially made use of the P-56 sword bayonet before being replaced with straight sawback bayonets. A similar thing happened with the Martini Henry, which initially used old P-53 bayonets with a bushing inside the socket to fit over the narrower barrel before the P-76 socket bayonet was issued. The P-76 looks very similar to the Pattern 53, even maintaining the side mounting for some reason, but the blade and the tip were now dead straight. The switch to breech loading meant that bayonet mounts were now able to be put on the centre line of the rifle. 
normally mounted under the barrel for a more balanced weapon. The 12-inch pattern 1903 knife bayonet was too short for the number 1 Mark III Enfield rifle, and it was replaced with a 17-inch pattern 1907 bayonet, which served the British and Commonwealth troops during World War I, albeit often sawn down to make trench knives. Come World War II, a cheap and crude bayonet was issued to troops, indicative of both the shortages in the UK at the time and the much reduced importance of bayonets in modern warfare. The number four bayonet was a crude, short throwback to the socket bayonet, with a simple eight-inch spike. The initial versions had a better design to them, at least, with cruciform blades made in the Singer sewing machine factory in Scotland. The later versions are just sharpened steel rods. Nicknamed pig stickers, these bayonets were not popular to say the least. The pattern happening worldwide was that bayonets were losing their importance. Although few countries produced bayonets as crude and ugly as the number four. Modern military rifles still have bayonets though. They tend to be small, serviceable combat knives, like this example here from the Vietnam War. Often these knife bayonets incorporate useful tools into their designs, such as wire cutters. Now for some examples of some weird and wonderful creations. In 1786, an experimental breech-loading flintlock carbine was designed by the Swiss gunmaker Dus Egg. It was issued for testing to the British 7th, 10th, 11th, 15th and 16th Light Dragoons. Egg claimed to have invented it, but in fact he had stolen the design from Giuseppe Crespi of Milan. This carbine had the most wonderfully mad bayonet, a 30-inch long spear, designed to turn the carbine into a lance when fixed. Soldiers have been finding inventive uses for their bayonets ever since they were first invented. And I don't mean just as dramatic bottle openers. Before entrenching tools became common, when troops were caught out in the open and under fire, soldiers would often use their bayonets to hurriedly dig rifle pits for cover. The US Springfield Trapdoor 1873 trowel bayonet was an answer to that problem. If the soldier had the need to do some archaeology, or work on the pointing of the brickwork of their fort, sure, perfect tool. But as far as weapons of war go, it was pretty weak. The last bayonet I'll mention is also from the mines of Springfield Armoury, who I'm guessing had something against the entire concept of bayonets. The ramrod bayonet, used in both the 1884 Springfield and resurrected for the 1903 Springfield. This pointy cleaning rod was supposed to function instead of a proper bladed bayonet. It was a farce. You might as well stab someone with a Phillips head screwdriver. Theodore Roosevelt wrote to the Ordnance Department, Sir, I must say that I think the rod bayonet is about as poor an invention as I ever saw. As you observed, it broke short off as soon as hit with even moderate violence. It would have no moral effect and mighty little physical effect. As a result of his letter, tens of thousands of rifles had to be retrofitted to accept a sword bayonet. Bayonets had been part of warfare for 330 years. The bayonet charge was an action that could cause ill-disciplined soldiers to break and run. And the veritable porcupines formed by squares of troops with fixed bayonets would keep marauding cavalry at bay. Just hope there isn't any artillery around to exploit that tight formation. Here in New Zealand, the British troops ended up in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Māori on quite a few occasions. Here's one such example. Sergeant John Murray, VC, was an Irish soldier, born in Burr, Offaly County. He served in the 68th Durham Light Infantry. He served in the Crimean War and was promoted to sergeant while the 68th were in Burma. In 1863, the 68th left Burma, arriving in New Zealand in 1864. They were almost immediately dispatched to the Bay of Plenty where on the 29th of April the 68th were amongst the British army under General Cameron that was defeated by Māori at Gate Pa, losing 35 men killed and 75 wounded. On the 21st of June, 
Murray was amongst the British force that encountered 600 Maori building a new pa at Tauranga. The decision was made to assault it quickly before the defences could be completed. In a ferocious bayonet charge, followed by brutal hand-to-hand combat with the Maori defenders, Murray earned his Victoria Cross. He ran up to a rifle pit containing 8 to 10 Maori and single-handedly killed or wounded every one of them before moving on. He was armed with a sword bayonet, much like this one. Corporal John Byrne, VC, was part of the same regiment, and he was the first man of his company to jump into the Taranga rifle pits, where he immediately bayoneted a Maori warrior. The Maori grabbed the rifle and held it inside of him, while trying to cut Byrne down with his tomahawk. They struggled for a while before Murray appeared and killed the Maori, and then proceeded to fight his way deeper into the pa. The problem Corporal Byrne had with his bayonet not immediately dispatching his opponent was not unusual, neither was the issue of over-penetration and getting the blade stuck. For this kind of technical combat-based information, I'll again refer you to Matt Easton at Scholar Gladiatoria, who does an excellent job of discussing these techniques and the issues with bayonet fighting better than I ever could. Due to the fierce hand-to-hand combat that often took place here in New Zealand, the bayonet was a weapon of great importance, which is why I've devoted an entire video to it. Thanks for watching, and please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers!